China was just sent back to the dark ages. Now, for decades, many have been forecasting the fast rising China would take over the United States as the dominant superpower in the world, displacing the United States, and we might all be speaking Chinese one day. Well, anyway, as I've reported many times over the last two years, China has big, big problems. Problems so big, I don't think they can overcome them, such as demographics, water, energy, food, political dysfunction, and more. And if that wasn't enough for them to deal with on their own, the US has been in trade wars with them since the Trump era, specifically the tech sector. The trade war shutting down Huawei, ZTE, you know, targeting TikTok and all that, right? But what just happened is so much bigger and so much more severe as it stands right now. China is finished literally sent back to the dark ages. So in this video, I'm going to break down what just happened to China that changes everything you know and what your expectations would be, how this affects China, the United States, and other players, what the ramifications are of China, what the new risks are and will be, what China's next move could be, and what this all means to you. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss and I make these videos to change the way you look at money, the way that you look at the world, and the world is changing rapidly. It's exciting, it's scary. Now, if we navigate this correctly, it could be the massive opportunity we're all looking for. That's my plan anyway. And hopefully, I'm bringing you with me as long as you wanna come along. So let's take a look and see what's going on in the world. This is massive news. As a matter of fact, this might be some of the biggest news that I can think of in my life. I mean, this is that big, and I'm not trying to give you like this hyped up thing. I mean, this is big, big, big news. It has massive implications, and we'll talk about some of those implications in a minute. All right, so let's frame this up here. Um, the new oil. Now, the, the, the wealth of a nation has always been based off of the natural resources that they have. Of course, uh, gold, minerals, and oil. Energy is what the whole world needs. It's what drives the entire world, and so nations that have oil, uh, did very, very well. Nations without energy, without oil, did poorly. So oil is, um, is, has been the most desirable commodity in the world, but microchips are the new oil. They've been kind of like the new oil. So let's run through this real quickly just, to, just so I can show you how big this is before I break down exactly what happened and what the ramifications are. So uh, just real quickly, let's just get you up to speed. The history of semiconductors, microchips. You hear about them, what are they? You kind of have an idea, but you may not know that Bell Laboratories in the United States of course, in the US, invented the transistor in 1947. So the transistor was something just very simple on a circuit board before the semiconductors. Okay, so Bell Labs, 1947. 1959, about a decade later, the bipolar integrated circuit, ICS, this is when things really started taking off, was invented by Kilby of Texas Instruments. All right, so Texas Instruments, again, Texas, the United States, took off with it, um, and Fairchild Semiconductor in the US. It marked the dawn of the IC era, of course, that's the integrated circuits. 1967, so right around 1970, I talk a lot about the five industrial revolutions. 1971, the age of the microprocessor. 1970, basically right there, Texas Instruments developed the electronic desktop calculator. Now, if you're old enough, like me, you remember those real basic calculators? Uh, well, that's what we're talking about here. The calculator, um, you don't think about how advanced that is, but it needs semiconductors um, to work. Semiconductors are now used in every corner of our society and support everyday life. So this is kind of a picture of the silicon transistor. Uh, and then as 1970, the microprocessor, they go in like alarm clocks on your desk. Um, and then as they've gone up, video games, personal computers, mobile phones, smartphones, etc. So that's kind of the, the deal. But I wanted to show you the history of that and uh, of, of the technical, technological revolution and that it started in the United States. Now we're going to come back to that. Now this is a little bit of the history or of the global semiconductor industry, or I should say not the history, but the demand of the global semiconductor industry from 20 to 20 to 2025. And what you can see is this massive growth. Of course, this is forecast for 2025 and you can see this and this kind of shows you what these are all being used for so we have 11% for automotive we have 31% for communications so the 
Technological revolution, microprocessor, led to the internet, telecommunications. So here we go, telecommunications, 31%. Industrial use is 12%. Um, data processing, a big one, almost 35%. Servers, we're gonna talk about that more in a minute. And then down here, this little bit of black, 11% for consumer electronics. They're basically in anything. Anything that turns on, any type of device has some sort of a chip in it. Now, like I said, the demand is growing. Of course, we're moving more into the information age, the technical digital age. And so everything's gonna need chips. We're gonna need more chips. We're gonna need more advanced chips. Now, China obviously has massive demand for it. When I talk about it as being the new oil, I mean it's the new oil. This is China's trade balance from 2020. This is two years ago, so it's gotten a lot more off balance. But what we can see right here is this is their semiconductors, and they are importing, they are spending almost twice the amount of money on semiconductors than they do for oil. Now this is a big deal because China has to import about 85% of their energy, unlike the United States, which is the largest exporter of energy. So China has to import all their energy and they still spend almost double on the semiconductors that they do in oil. Why is that? Well, because China's manufacturing everything, right? They're manufacturing all the robotics and the AI and everything electronic and they need all these semiconductors, right? We're going to come back to that. All right, but if you think China is leading the race, you might be wrong. As a matter of fact, right where it all started is still at the top. So this is top semiconductor companies. Now, Intel sits at the top of the heap. We'll talk more about Intel and its place and where TSMC from Taiwan fit in. We'll come back to that. $72 billion from Intel. Then we have right here, so we have Samsung, which is now moved in the lead, and Taiwan Semiconductor. Um, and those two, again, South Korea and Taiwan, friends, allies, friendly countries with the U.S. And then we have uh, U.S., 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 U.S. So you see who is leading the race. It's still the United States or the friendly countries. We're going to break this down a little bit more, but I want to frame this up before we dig in. Okay, so I also want to explain this part to you really quickly. So there's three main types of semiconductors. This is super important for you to understand. All right, so tier one, is the highest level chips. These are the most advanced, the fastest chips, and they go in the brand new iPhones. They go in brand new iPhones servers. Remember we talked about the, uh, the servers, they have 30, what, 35% of the market. Servers, power management systems, these are the tier one chips, the most advanced chips. Then we have two, tier two, and these go in things like cars, your smart thermostats, you know, they, they can run basic functions. And then we have tier three, which are the most basic. They just go into like a real basic watch. Uh, again, back to like that Texas Instruments calculator. So real basic things like your alarm clock that just sits on your um, nightstand. So real basic things, tier three. Tier one and two is really where all this stuff done, obviously tier one. So it's important to understand so you can understand exactly what's happened. So let's dig into this a little bit. So the tech arms race is on. So we, we have been in a period since 1944, Bretton Woods Agreement. We've been in, the, after World War II, we've been in this period of globalization where the world has had increased peace, increased prosperity, and this globalization has allowed us all to work with each other. Specialized um, industries, free and open trade, and because of that, um, we haven't really had to be racing other people in arms or technology because we just share. As a matter of fact, an iPhone, I believe, has parts from like six different continents inside that phone. So we haven't been racing with anybody. There's been no competition. Now, we did have the arms race in the Cold War era where Russia and the U.S. were competing to see who could build the biggest arsenal of nuclear weapons. But then now, I believe we're having a tech arms race, and this is exactly what's framing up. Why? Well, because the world is breaking apart. All right, so uh, the U.S. drops the hammer, or we might say that the U.S. just psh, hit them right back to the dark ages. Now, a lot of people look at um, China like this, with this big old bicep, the all-powerful China, right? They're gonna take over the world. They're gonna install their social credit score system. You got Ray Dalio praising China how great they are, how powerful they are, and then people look at the United States as this little scrawny little guy over here, and we're just the whipping boy of China. That's how the world looks. Everyone is expecting China to take over. Their economy is growing so fast, and on and on and on. Well, it kind of was, but, with uh, one Biden administrative action, whoosh, that ended it, just like that. So let's look at some of this a little bit. So in 1990, 
under the WTO agreement, this helped bring China up to speed technologically. Now, it's important to understand, we'll come back to this, but it's important to understand, China, China's, China's been around forever. Their dynasties have been around as long as the world's been around, right? However, China lost their place in the world back when the entire world moved to the gold standard. China wanted to stay on a silver standard. They lost their place in the world. They've been fighting to get back, but then they had Mao's great leap forward which was actually a great leap backwards. They went into crazy communism, about 50 million people died, and it's that communism that held them back. Why? In America, where we have individualism, where we have freedom, we have creativity. The individualism, the freedom, the creativity allows us to see problems and come up with solutions, allows us to have freedom of speech. So we have these ideas, we share them, we sharpen them, we produce them. When you're in communism, you have no free thought. Right? Everyone is an automaton. Everyone has to think the same thing. It takes away the creativity. It takes away the ingenuity. So after the Mao's Great Leap Forward, 50 million people died, China could not get up to speed. They couldn't compete in the world stage until they added a little bit of capitalism in the 80s. So let's open up a little bit of free ports. Let's open up a little bit of free trade. And that little bit of capitalism exploded China. But really what brought it forward was in 1990, under the WTO agreement, it helped China bring in technology. So they started to import technologies, which really got up to speed. And now, over the last few decades, China has been getting more and more and more advanced. You hear about them taking over the world with their AI and their ballistic missile systems and their quantum computing and all those things, but that's all because we, we being the United States, NATO, et cetera, allowed them to get the technology they needed because they can't develop it on their own. We'll talk about more of that in a minute. But then, starting in 2020 with the Trump uh, wars, we'll call them wars, they were uh, trade wars, tariff wars, we started applying tariffs. Now you remember why he was doing it. Um, it was because of the technology that they're stealing, not developing, but stealing. We're going to talk about that in a second. But so they started in 2020, and then here we are, 2022, Biden <laughs> signs it, <laughs> restricts it, and they're done. What do, what do I mean they're done? The law that was passed by Biden says that China is now unable to import any types of tools or equipment. So they, they can't make the chips. First of all, China doesn't make the chips. Um, they're made by other countries. I showed you by South Korea, by Taiwan, and by the United States. China doesn't make any. They need the chips. They spend more on chips and oil to make everything. But now they're unable to import chips, buy chips. They're unable to import any tools or equipment to make or service or even operate the chips. Right? So they can't service, operate, or anything in the chips. They're done. They can't, they can't buy them. The ones that they already have, they can't service them, they can't operate them, nothing. On top of that, all US persons and companies are forced to choose. Either one, leave China, or two, lose your US citizenship. And just like that, overnight, China was done, sent back to the dark ages, and everybody left. So China chips, microchips, they're dead. It's done, just like that. Now let's talk about what this means. Now a couple things I wanna show you. Uh, all right, now, uh, what are the implications of this? So what does this really mean? Now, it's happened, it's all over the news, you can go find out, but what's the implications? Well, China's unable to advance technologically. <laughs> they just can't, they don't have any chips. They can't make the chips, they can't buy the chips, they can't even get the equipment needed to service the facilities that even make the chips. They're done. They can't make the chips, they're unable to operate facilities for the level one chips. Uh, basically, any industry that needs hardware dies. <laughs> Any industry that need hardware dies. So they can make clothes, they can make shoes, they can make tires, they can make desks, they can make furniture. They can't make refrigerators or TVs or computers or missiles or robotics or any of that. Anything technological, they're done. Anything that needs hardware is dead. All this, AI, automations, their firewalls, the Great Firewall of China, it's gonna be hard to keep that up. Social credit score systems, all their surveillance systems, gonna be really hard to keep that up. Hyper missiles that they have, their defense, gonna be hard to do that. Uh, their space program, yep, that's done. <laughs> Supercomputers, robots, yeah, all that's done. <laughs> they can make furniture, they can make clothes, they can make uh, tires, that's what they get to make. Now, this is a big deal. 
I'm going to tell you how big this is, but look how hungry China is for semiconductors. This is since 2004. And look at the increase of how many chips. Now, this only goes to 2017. If we went to 2022, it'd probably be more like this. And what we can see is that um, the rise of China has been taking a more and more um, share of the chips being man, uh, purchased from the rest of the world. Now, what do they need them for? Well, they need them for all those advanced things. China had put together a new plan under President Xi. Their new plan was Made in China 2025. This is a new initiative. They're trying to spearhead it, sort of like what the US did by trying to re-onshore the chips. We're gonna talk about that. But so China had their own initiative. Made in China 2025. And what they wanted to do is start to build all these super technologically advanced things, including uh, electrical equipment, new um, EV vehicles, information technologies, all kinds of new materials, new robotics, aerospace, agriculture equipment, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, new maritime engineering. They had this big initiative by 2025 to develop all this, and all that's gone. Like, just like that, with a snap of a finger, their entire economy is dead. All the technology is gone. Now, China was already on the brink, right? They're already on the brink. They don't have the technology, right? They buy it, they can put it together. They can't manufacture themselves. They don't have the capabilities to do that. Um, they don't have the workers that know how to do it. They don't have the technical skills required to do that. Um, they don't have the resources. They don't even have the equipment to make it. We're going to talk more about some of these resources and what's required to, but the supply chains, they don't have access to that. They have to import all that. And they got way, way bigger problems than this. If this isn't big enough, they have bigger ones. I'm going to lay those out for you. All right, so China's on the ropes and the U.S. is in the driver's seat. Now, the U.S. is in the driver's seat because we have all the ingenuity, all the creativity. We create this. Now, it's true that Taiwan produces the microchips, but it's the U.S. that controls all the supplies. As I already told you, the United States is where the semiconductor was invented in the first place. Um, but what about Taiwan? What about South Korea, right? Samsung, TSMC, they're getting up bigger and faster than Intel is, right, Mark? Well, let's take a look at that. So Taiwan does, yes, make about 65% of the world's semiconductors and almost 90% of the advanced chips. It's true, the United States doesn't have the capabilities to make as advanced chips as Taiwan. That's true. By comparison though, China produces a little over 5%, uh, while the US produces 10% of the chips, but basic chips, not the advanced ones like Taiwan does. So that, that, that part is true. However, the United States is still heavily in control. So what we can see here, is that according to this 2020 State of the U.S. Semiconductor Industry Report, America remains the leader in semiconductor marketplace, 65% global fabulous market, 51% of global IDM market, 40% of global equipment market, but it's even bigger than that. So, like I said, Taiwan has the capabilities to make the most advanced chips. The U.S. doesn't. However, the United States remains the unchallenged world leader, the unchallenged leader in semiconductor design, controlling about 85% of the world market for electronic design automation. So the United States designs it, invents it, and then we give it to Taiwan to put it together. So it's not like they're smarter than we are. They have better capabilities than we are. We have part of it. They have part of it. We're working together in that. Now, that's important to understand, which we'll come back to in a little bit uh, when it comes to China and Taiwan. We're going to talk about that. But also, if that doesn't put U.S. in the driver's seat enough as it is, then this certainly does. So what we can see is the ultra-pure, super-secret sand, that's silica sand. Silica sand is made to, or used to make semiconductors. So the sand that makes the, your iPhone possible, that makes, so the, the highest in chips that go in like iPhones and everything else, the highest in chips need the purest silica sand available. And you know where that comes from? Good old North Carolina in the United States. The processor that makes your laptop or cell phone work was fabricated using quartz from this obscure Appalachian backwater, North Carolina. So um, the U.S. designs the chips, we produce the materials for the chips, and then we send it over to Taiwan for it to be manufactured. So the U.S. is clearly in control. Like I said, Taiwan's the largest producer of chips, but they're reliant on the U.S. for design. Now, the U.S. is taking all of this back. Now, if we're not already in the driver's seat enough, we want more. So you've probably heard by now, under the Biden administration, under this new 
CHIPS Act. Um, they basically, the United States wants to re-onshore all um, of our domestic production of these chips. So it's cool that, you know, Taiwan works with us and they're friendly and, and South Korea, and it's cool that they take our designs and our materials to put them together, but we want that to be done here. We want to have greater control over that. We'd like those U.S. jobs as well. And so what's happening is under this CHIPS Act, you can see uh, the CHIPS for American Act, why it's necessary and what it does. And what we can see is that there's $50 billion of incentives for U.S. and foreign companies to come build in the United States. So just like these American companies are going to build in China, now the U.S. is saying, hey, foreign companies, come build in the United States. It's a pretty big, pretty big deal. We can see lots and lots of big people are coming. Uh, Qualcomm is committed to spending an additional $4 billion on chips. As a matter of fact, I kind of outlined them right here. Um, Micron, $100 billion are going to spend to build a facility in New York. Intel, a $20 billion facility in Ohio. Qualcomm building a facility in New York. And TSMC from Taiwan that controls the majority of the market, the most advanced chips, they're going to come and build in Arizona. So instead of sending stuff to Taiwan to get built, Taiwan is going to build it here in America. We expect over 42,000 highly skilled jobs to be added. So if the U.S. didn't already have enough control, it is coming on stronger. Now, like I said, this sends China back to the dark ages. I can't imagine a bigger blow. Sure, they can make clothes and furniture and tires and shoes, but nothing that has hardware, no electronics. Their AI, robotics, compute, everything is done. Even their military. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to, I mean, you can fight with guns, but no, uh, no weapons that require any type of robotics or hardware. So that's a big problem, a really, really big problem. But China has even bigger problems. So we talked about the technology. We talked about that, but they have bigger problems. I'm not going to dive into each, each of these. This will trigger you enough to go do your own research, or you can leave me a comment. Let me know if you want videos on these topics, but they have a massive demographic problem. Uh, this is bigger than most people even understand or can even think about if I give it to you quickly. But this is the demographics in 2020. And what this shows is the largest segment of their population is right here, between 50 and 80 years old. The problem is you don't have enough young people down here. So as these people move up and age out, there's no young people coming up below them. This is a math problem. This is not conspiratorial and there's no fix for this. China desperately needs 30 year olds today because they had a one child policy for decades. They desperately need 30 year olds and they can't have them. They can go pay every girl in the world or in China a million dollars to have a baby. It doesn't fix their problem. Within 25 years, half of the Chinese population will be gone. They'll just be timed out. They'll be old. There's not enough people. Chinese population, 1.3, 1.4 billion people will be cut down to six or 700 million within 25 years. That is a big, massive problem. We can do a video on that if you want. They have another big problem, and that is water. China's uh, a national water emergency. So China faces some of the most serious water issues on the entire planet. China, a big problem. Uh, you know you can go 40 days without food, you can only go about three days without water. Water is essential for life. Drought and pollution combine to make devastating water problems. So they don't have enough water as it is, and the water that they do have, they've completely contaminated. They've completely polluted out. That's a problem. The country has 20% of the world's population with less than 8% of the water. Now you need water for people to live. They don't have enough for that. You need water for crops to grow. You need water for energy. So you need water to cool your coal and your nuclear reactor and your natural gas plants. You need water for your manufacturing and they don't have any. That is a massive problem on its own. Then we have energy. So China's power problems expose a strategic weakness. China has to import about 85% of its energy. Now, what if they can't import it? What if there was like a blockade that prevented ships from coming on board? What if other nations didn't want to sell to China anymore? China's done. This is a very, it's a strategic weakness that they have. Um, then we have the food situation. This is even worse. Uh, Xi Jinping admits China could face a severe food crisis in 2022. China doesn't have the arable land. In the United States, 
It's like the bread basket over here. We can grow food everywhere. In China, it's mostly desert and they don't have the water. They don't have the land they need to feed their people. We have a financial crisis that's happening, a banking crisis, and then we have political dysfunction on top of that, kind of going back to what I was talking about, capitalism versus communism. Um, the problem is, as I already laid out with communism, it's a big problem, but it's only getting worse because now Xi Jinping has given um, no indications of stepping away from power. They just had their big Congress meeting and he's just given himself more runway, more years to continue to rule the Chinese party by iron fist. The problem is in a situation like that is now he's up there all alone without getting information needed. It's never going to work. It never has worked and it's only going to continue to be a problem. So this is, <laughs> if the technology isn't a big enough problem, this all is. Now, what happens next? I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but let's look at a couple scenarios here. So scenario number one, China goes all the way back to the dark ages. They leave the factories, they go back to the fields, they do their, grow their rice. Um, they can still make some stuff, textiles, you know, things like that, but they're out of technology. That's option number one. Um, at this point, that's the most likely option. Now, what other options are there? Well, another option is that China takes Taiwan by force, by war. Now, this is not a far out idea. Of course, we've talked about this before on the channel, but we can see right here, Chinese military to prepare for war, as President Xi said. This is what he said in his, uh, in his speech the other day. Prepare for war. China's People's Liberation Army must, quote, prepare for war. They will not stand down. They will not let um, anybody get in their way of taking Taiwan back. That's what they're saying. And what does the United States say? Well, the United States agrees. As a matter of fact, Blinken warns China on, quote, a faster timeline to force Taiwan to submit for unification. So um, the China says we're going to take it. The U.S. says, yes, they're moving faster to take it. So that's a real problem. Um, I guess we want to go to war with China. Now, if they take over Taiwan, does that fix their situation? Do they instantly get microchips? Well, no, because remember, Taiwan doesn't make the chips on their own. They need the designs from the U.S. They need the silica from the U.S. So what do they do in absence of that? Plus, uh, a lot of people have said strategies, uh, chip manufacturers in Taiwan said if China were to take Taiwan by force, they would blow up all the factories. Not China, but Taiwan. Taiwan or the U.S. would just blow them up. That way they wouldn't fall into China hands. So even if they took Taiwan, they wouldn't get the factories. And even if they did get the factories, they don't have the supplies they need to build them. So that's possible. Now, uh, war is possible. It's everywhere. That's another possibility. And then maybe a more likely outcome is the U.S. uses this as a bargaining chip. Maybe the U.S. says, hey, you know this problem we're having with Ukraine and, uh, and Russia? Um, China, you're a problem because you're buying all the energy from Russia. We're trying to sanction them over here, but you're giving them all the money. So tell you what, if you join us and help us defeat Russia, if you help us defeat them by sanctioning them, not buying their stuff, maybe providing some of your weapons to Ukraine, etc., in exchange for you joining sides with us, we'll give you back access to the technology. And maybe it's a bargaining chip. I don't know which one of these things it is, one, two, or three, but I'd love to hear your opinion. You could drop that one, two, or three in the comments down below. Let me know what you think. Now, uh, I don't know which one it is. Um, for sure, we know one's happening right now. Um, two is highly likely, but three seems very likely as well. So let me know what you think. Um, either way, this is one of the biggest pieces of news that I've seen, like I can remember at all. The leader, the global leader in technology, China, is gonna take over the world just got decapitated. Now, I'd love to hear what you think. As always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. If you don't like the video, give me a thumbs down, but tell me why in the comments down below. Please click on that subscribe button and the bell notifications to know when I put new videos out. And that's what I got. To your success, I'm out.